In this video, we are going to show how to derive the order of a chemical reaction. Let's assume, for the sake of generality, that we can write the rate law in the following way. So we have the, the rate of the reaction. We always have a rate constant K. And let's assume that there are three reactants. It's called the first reactant A, the second reactant B, and the third reactant C. There will be a reaction order relative to each of these particular reactants. So for example, there'll be a reaction order just related to A. So that's the superscript we have there. And we'll call the reaction order uh, with respect to A, X. We also have the order with respect to B, and we'll use Y for that. And the reaction order with respect to C will be Z. When we have such a expression, the overall order of the reaction, the total order, will be X plus Y plus C. It is important to note that the reaction order with respect to a particular uh, reactant or to the entire reaction is an experimental concept. So the only way that we can find out the order of a reaction is by doing experiments. Now, truly, the order of a reaction, if we know the x, y, and z, we can compute that. We can just put x plus y plus z. So now we're going to show how do we find the values of these individual x, y's, and z, and how we can use those to better understand the reaction. Our first step will be to vary the concentration of A, but keep B and C constant. One of the tricks of this technique is that we will vary the concentration of one of the reactants while holding every other reactant's concentration constant. Now, we've, I've done this having three reactants just so it makes it easier to see the general case. We could have it anywhere from one to an infinite number of reactants, but the same general technique will apply. The next step is a little tricky, but if we're going to vary the concentrations of A, I need to have a way of referring to the concentration of A the first time, the concentration of A the second time, whatever. So let's call the concentration of A, the first time I run the experiment, A sub 1. Pretty straightforward. And let's call the concentration of A the second time I run the experiment, 2. To employ this technique, we could conceivably run the experiment numerous times, numerous variations of A, B, and C, but the simplest way to do it is when we vary a particular reactant is to do the reaction twice. Now notice that if I vary A between A1 and A2, I'm still keeping B and C constant. So how can we write that down and remind ourselves that B and C are going to be constant? Well, one way to do that, to keep this same notation, is just write the concentration of B both times as B sub zero, and the concentration of C each time as C sub zero. This will become clearer uh, in the next couple steps of why we want to do it this way. So, now I notice that this rate expression will be true no matter what. So, let me cleverly write it a certain way and write this as rate number two. So, no matter, this is the rate under any circumstance, so a specific time rate number two, the general form will be exactly the same. The rate constant does not change. It's very important. That's why it's the rate constant. The second time we run the experiment, let's say that the concentration of A is going to be A sub two. So two for two. And we know that the exponent of A is going to be X, okay? For B, B is going to have this unchanging concentration, so we'll just call that concentration B sub zero, and its exponent is going to be 
a small y. And again, c is going to be held constant. So let's call it c sub 0. And then the exponent is going to be z. That's pretty straightforward, but it's nice to show how we can employ the rate expression up here in a specific case. Let me just try this one more time, and we'll see if you can see what I'm doing here. So let's call another run of the experiment. We'll call this rate one. So rate two is the rate of the reaction the second time we run the reaction. Rate one is the rate when we run it the first time. So no matter what, the rate constant stays the same, so k will be the same. But now our concentration of A is going to be A sub 1 rather than A sub 2. A sub 1. And then the exponent is going to be X. Remember, B doesn't change between runs, so it's still going to be B sub 0 with an exponent of Y. And then the concentration of C is going to be C sub 0 with an exponent of Z. You may ask, you may already have asked, why did you write down the expression for rate 2 before you wrote down the expression for rate 1? Well, that will be explained immediately because we're going to use a trick here. Since this is a true expression, and this is a true expression, remember in algebra we know that if we do the same thing to both sides of an equation, we haven't changed anything. So I can divide one side of the equation by the other. So long as rate 1 and this are not equal to 0. So this was a mathematics course. We would also write out in detail which things cannot be equal to 0. But this does show why I wrote rate 2 versus rate 1. Because it'll make much of what we're doing later on a little easier to manage mathematically. Now we've run the experiment twice with two different concentrations of A, but with the concentration of B held the same both times and the concentration of C held the same in both the runs. So now we want to see what we can do with our expression here and see if we can make it a little more useful for us. One of the things, first things to notice is that on the right hand side in particular, we have a K and a K. Well, as we recall, that if we have a constant over a constant, as long as they're not equal to zero, I can use the cancellation law and cancel. So let me just kind of write this out this way. So k will end up being canceled with the k at the bottom. a sub 2 divided by a sub 1. a2 and a1 are different things. Now notice they have the same exponent, but they're different. So I cannot cancel a2 and a1. So let me just write the a2 part up here with its particular exponent. Now, if you continue along the top, we notice I have b sub 0 divided by b sub 0. Since b sub 0 is not equal to 0, I can cancel, and that becomes the number 1. This is k over k is the number 1, and we can cancel. Last but not least, c sub 0 is the same as c sub 0, so this last expression also reduces to the number 1. So we've been able to reduce the entire numerator of our expression to simply a sub 2 to the x power. Let's follow what happens to the denominator. We have rate 1 here. Rate 2 and rate 1 are different things. k here was eliminated because we canceled it with the k above. Let's also notice this kind of move over. If b sub 0 and b sub 0, these cancel. The c's, c sub 0 is canceled. But I can't cancel a sub 1 because a sub 1 and a sub 2 are not the same thing. And it's also raised to the x power. So just by using the properties of constants, I've been able to reduce my expression from this complicated beast up here to this much simpler expression, rate 2 divided by rate 1 equals a sub 2 to the x power divided by a sub 1 to the x power. What we would really like to do is to be able to solve for this exponent x. Because once I know x, y, and z, the overall order of the reaction is just the sum x plus y plus z. But I notice that I have an x as an exponent here, and x as an exponent there. And when we have variable exponents, that can be tricky. 
So let me demonstrate a couple of techniques which will be very, very, very useful. The first is to use one of the important properties of exponents. And then I can essentially pull the exponent out of a parenthesis. So I can raise the fraction a sub 2 divided by a sub 1 to the x power. So be sure to convince yourself that if I use any um, whole number of values of x on the right-hand side here, that I will get the exact same expression on the left-hand side. This will also work for non-integer values, but it's much easier to see for the integer values. Okay, so now we have rate 2 divided by rate 1 equals a2 divided by a1 to the x power. Is there anything we can do which will still get the x out of being an exponent? The classic trick in this case is to take the natural log of each side. So we take the natural log of rate 1 divided by rate 2, rate 2 divided by rate 1, sorry. And then we take the natural log of the expression we're going to write to the right. And that's simply our a sub 2 divided by a sub 1 to the x power. Okay. And now we can use a very important technique of logarithms, which are actually right in blue here, is that if I try to take the natural log of a to the x power, this is equal to x times the natural log of a. It's an incredibly important and useful property of logarithms, which we use in chemistry a great deal. So we see that a great way of getting a variable away from being an exponent is to take the natural log of each side. Now, in this particular case, if I take the natural log of the left-hand side, it doesn't give any great simplification, but I still have natural log of rate 2 divided by rate 1. But I can use this trick on the right-hand side. Since, since I'm taking the natural log of something to a power, I can pull the x, the variable, in front of the natural logarithm, and that's incredibly helpful here. Now notice that we no longer have a variable as an exponent. 